Hey, what's up everybody? My name's Russ, rwgresearch.com. Man, it's been a little while. I've gathered my thoughts and um, I have some more discussing to do and some more conversations to be had. And so I hope you stick around. If you have not seen the other videos of this series, this is number nine. So you're going to want to go watch them or you won't understand what we're doing. Or at least it won't make as much sense. Um, I have a lot to cover. So I, I apologize in advance for how long this is going to take. I will try to make it quick, but I guarantee nothing. I also think it's extremely important for you guys to watch this particular video. And I really need you guys' feedback. Uh, so that's what we're doing. Today's date is 11, 7, 17. My board is a little off whack there. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about, uh, we got a lot to talk about, but the first thing we're going to talk about is a, a problem that we have. Okay, we're going to talk about resistance. So if I have a light bulb, okay, let's say it's a, uh, a resistor, okay, and this resistor has one ohm of resistance, and I put... 10 volts DC, right, across this thing, all right, oh well, if I put 1 ohm of resistance, 10 volts DC, this is a filament light bulb, okay, not an LED or something like that, a filament, a actual tungsten filament resistance, okay, according to our known math, we're going to be dropping, um, 10 amps across 1 ohm, 10 volt DC, right? So this is 100 watts, okay? So what do we do? We say, hey, we're going to set up a test load. We're going to put a resistor across it, and we are going to assume it's one resistance when it's, uh, when it's cold, right? And we're going to say, if I put 10 volts across it, I have 10 amps, I have 100 watts. And we do the calculation, and we try to use like a light bulb as a reference, and we determine how bright it is. Well, here's the problem. Resistance is a very interesting thing. Ohm's law, right, when you're dealing with DC, Ohm's law only applies to ohmic resistance. <clears throat> this is an ohmic resistance, but it is not linear, okay? So if we have a graph like this, right, an ohmic, a pure ohmic resistance is like this. So if this is a current and this is voltage, right, the more amperage we put in, the more voltage we put in, we have a straight line. Well, that's for an ohmic resistance. But if we're talking about a light bulb, even though it's an ohmic resistance, it's not steady. Okay, the curve may look something like this. And why is that? Because when you heat an element, it changes resistance. And this is important for those of you who, who are using resistive loads as your test subject for your devices. It's very important that you pay attention to this. You really need to know the curve of the device you're loading or you'll have problems. So that was just an important thing I wanted to share with you, but I have much more to discuss. Okay. So, no, oh, that black stains. Anyway, what is, okay, what is a spark gap? Okay, what is a spark gap? Well, the resistance of the spark gap is set by the distance and the medium, right? The medium between whatever it is. We'll say it's air. Okay, I'm not going to get real technical on you. I just want to bring something to your attention. So if it's air, we have a high resistance. And depending on the size of these electrodes, we actually have a capacitor. And it actually becomes an inductor in certain scenarios. So we actually have more than just a spark gap. We have a lot of these different variables that happen within this one device. So if I were to generate a spark... Okay, let's, uh, let's, by the way, say that the air, right, the air is, I don't know, 10,000 ohms. 
right? Actually, it would probably be much higher. It'd probably be like 10,000 mega ohms. It'd be very high resistance. And you'd need, a, you'd need extreme voltage to jump whatever gap distance this is. However, what happens, okay, um, what happens, yeah, when we generate a spark, right? We get a plasma, okay? When we get a plasma, guess what? We get a very low resistance, and the bigger this plasma is, the bigger the gap, right? Or the, I mean, the bigger the uh, the column of plasma, right? We go even lower. Now, what is this? What is a spark cap? A spark cap is actually a negative resistor. Okay, a negative resistance because it's not a constant. Right, so if we were to look at the curve, it would literally look something like this. And it would probably be much, much, much more sharp. Something like that, actually. All right, so this is important because this resistance, whatever the column is, that resistance could potentially at some point actually be a better conductor than even a piece of copper or some other material that's a conductor. So that's a really interesting thought that you should really pay attention to. You can also have negative inductance and you can also have negative capacitance, negative resistance. It's the reverse of what you normally would see, right? Um, I believe when a filament gets hot, it has higher resistance. Don't quote me, could be wrong. I uh, actually don't know the answer to that question, so forgive me. But, um, but this is really important because a spark gap can act as a diode, as I showed you, right? As a one-time uh, punch, right? One-time flow through, and then it'll stop once the current stops, or the voltage is low enough to stop. It's also a negative resistor. It also allows for ultra-high current. That's another point I didn't bring up, right? So here, right, our current is basically infinity, right? But here, right, we have maximum amperage flow because we have a super low resistance. So we got from infinite to almost uncontrollably high, which is why when you see an electrical arc, an electrical fire or something like that, the copper literally vaporizes even though that there's potential there all the time it's not until this happens and it's not until you have an infinite resistance basically or lowest resistance and maximum amperage right and that's whenever the destruction happens so you can generate a tremendous amount of heat and power within this spark gap and there's other things i want to talk about but not today um, you can leave your comments in the comment section about spark gaps and your thoughts on them but the point that I want to bring is that they are a negative resistance and they allow for maximum current flow through the shortest amount of time possible. Um, so I want to start this conversation out with resistance because it is important and I'm going to be talking about a lot of resistance today. So forgive me, I'm not going to edit this video and I'm going to have to actually look at my notes and make sure I'm saying what I'm saying is correct or what I want to get across because I think this is going to be a very important, helpful video. Uh, along with future videos. Okay, no one has answered my question. What happens, okay, when you have a coil, right, you have a coil, and you have a switch, okay, what happens when you close this switch and you start to allow current to flow, but before it gets here, you open it back up. What happens? Okay. As far as I'm concerned, 
No one has answered that question. And I find it uh, a pretty important question to answer. Now, the reason that this is a hard question to answer is because voltage, right? Voltage, this is a good mark. Voltage is instant. These markers stain though, I need to get better ones. Oh, these are the best, the best. Anyway, what happens is that the potential, right? Let's say it's 100 volts, right? The potential, I probably drew that backwards if that way, but anyway, the potential is instantaneous because it knows that this circuit was connected and then current starts flowing. And current is like a snail's crawl compared to the voltage, which is basically the light speed. I mean, really. Um, it's instant because all the stuff in the copper knows, whatever you want to call it, electrons or you know, however you want to think of the theory, it doesn't really matter. The point is, is that instant. Nobody can answer the question. And it's a hard one to answer because this frequency needs to be in the nanosecond range. Okay? The nanosecond range. That's oh, fast. So how do we how do we deal with this? Okay? It's in the nanosecond range. And what I have been using, and I showed you in that in a couple of videos and in demo, uh, I was using a um, a read switch, right? Which is really nice. But in order to create a really nice, I guess it would be this way, magnetic field, however you want to look at it, uh, to, to generate a really big magnetic field with a coil, right, to get your maximum potential through this system, you basically need to do it really fast with high current, right? High current equals, I cannot spell, H-E-A-T, right? High current, right? I'm gonna leave this up here. High current equals heat. <clears throat> and resistance, we know, right? We know that our resistance is actually very helpful for us when we're doing a transfer. When we wanna create a magnetic field, we do this really fastly, right? And we do this fast enough that the current doesn't get all the way through, and what happens? Nobody has answered that question. And I don't know if you can, because it's a really, really difficult thing to do, because you have to switch faster than what semiconductors can switch right now. So anyway, beyond that question, we generate some heat, right? We generate heat, and if we generate heat, okay, it's bad. So what do we do? We create very, very low resistance. Well, lowest resistance means lowest losses, but it also means maximum current. So how do we get around this? Okay. And anytime we're generating heat, it means it's inefficient. Right? So how do we get around this? Well, I think the easiest way to do this is actually use resistance to our benefit. Right? It almost seems illogical. But if you can make a system run on voltage, okay, all right, or potential, all right, we'll see if I spelt the word right. I cannot spell. Potential. Forgive me, I don't really care about spelling because I <laughs> am an engineer. We talked about this. Okay, if you can make something run on potential, then this problem, right, it goes away. Because we want to run on volts. We want to run on pressure, okay? We want to make the pipe as small as possible, and we want to make the pressure as high as possible, and we want to make the resistance, which is the pipe diameter, really small. Okay? That's what we want to do. And why do we want to do that? Because we don't want to kill the dipole wherever it is our potential's coming from. We don't want to kill that system, right? So I told you. If you short a battery, right? 
it is no different than letting the battery be open. Right? Except the time. Right? It's time that we're worried about. This is a huge factor, time. We gotta play with that. So this battery, right, will go dead after, I don't know, three years of sitting on the shelf. This battery will go dead as soon as it overheats and blows up, most likely. But they're both gonna die across the resistor, or not. So therefore, the load, this short, or the open air, doesn't consume the energy, but instead the battery drains itself. This is a problem. So what do we do? Well, this is high current. This is infinite current. So we got to figure out a way to generate a system that uses pure potential. Because if we're not really concerned about killing the dipole, you know, we, 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 we realize that if we don't use the current, if there's no current flowing, we won't kill the dipole. Eventually, the system may kill itself, like this. But we know like this, right, it's going to be instant. Here it's going to be years. Years, right? So we want to make a system that runs on potential. Okay. Make sure I'm on my, uh, on my system here. Okay. Um, all right. So we want to use resistance to our advantage. That seems totally the reverse thinking of having no resistance as a superconductor versus having infinite resistance such as a spark gap in air. It seems a bit weird, but if we can run a system on voltage, we could have something serious. But we all know it takes current. It takes amperage, right? It takes current to do work. It takes current to make a magnetic field. Okay? Um, so let me ask you a question. I gotta mark out where I am. So I'm kind of skipping around. So let me ask you a question. Um, I think I'm going to get to this later. So let me follow my notes because I kind of have them in order. So we want to use resistance to our advantage. Okay, and we want to make voltage do work. That's difficult, but I think there's a way. Um, okay, so... Okay, so I'm going to skip a line. I'm going to come back and talk about these things. But right now I'm going to talk about this. Okay, so let me... I like this brown marker. I hope it shows up well, though. That's okay. So let me ask you a question. Um, if I have... A hundred pounds of copper. If I have a hundred pounds of copper, let it be... 18 AWG, but it's 100 pounds. 18 AWG, right, it's X feet, whatever that feet is, okay? And it has X resistance, okay? We're going to make up imaginary numbers because I want to make this easy for you to understand. Okay, so let's say it's actually um, 100 100 feet, and I don't know, let it be uh, 10 ohms. 100 feet, 10 ohms. So let me ask you a question. We know that if we have 100 feet of wire, and it's 18 AWG, and it's 10 ohms, that it has a certain amount of current, and it's probably going to be high. Amperage is going to be high. Okay? So, what if we did the reverse of this? Right, and this is a uh, an inductor. Okay, let's say we have another inductor. This one is the reverse of this. Okay, it's the same hundred pounds of copper. Okay, it's the same hundred pounds of copper, but this time, right, it's forty AWG. Okay, forty AWG. Okay, it's 48 WG. That's intense. It's probably a ridiculous. I 
a ridiculous amount of feet, okay? And also a ridiculous amount of ohms. Ridiculous, huge amount. What does this mean? This means the amps will be low, but the voltage will be high. Here the voltage can be pretty low. 12, 20, under 100 volts, right? This is gonna be more like a couple thousand volts. So I have a question. Let's talk about watts, okay? Um, I'm not gonna do the calculation, I'm just gonna throw a number out here, all right? But let's say this uses 10 watts and we have a certain battery and we know at 10 watts it's a certain battery is gonna drain it at a certain time. We know that. And we know, all right, this coil is going to generate one Tesla. These are imaginary numbers. So I'm just throwing numbers. We know this coil is going to generate one Tesla. Well, guess what? As long as we have the same 100 pounds of copper, we have the same amount of atoms in this copper, and it takes 10 watts to align all the atoms in this copper, that means it takes 10 watts to align all the atoms in this copper, right? 10 watts, right? And this is also one Tesla, yeah? But what's the difference? This one runs on volts, and this one runs on current. You gotta think about how much copper you're putting into something and what the result is. You can, yes indeed you can, you can generate a one Tesla and a one Tesla with the same amount of copper, with the same amount of wattage, but one with pure volts and one with mostly current. And when you're using volts, even though it's 10 watts, something else happens. It's different. Okay, it is different. And what's different? Well, it's pretty simple. It's right in front of you. Here, one, two, three. There are four turns with three spaces. Down here there's one, two, three, four spaces. Okay, that adds so much capacitance in this coil. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, right? And this one would probably be like 14 spaces between it, okay? The capacitance of this coil, the inductance is the same. Or is it? You answered that question. But the capacitance will change. Now, from my experience, and I'll let you guys answer this in the comments, but from my experience, something happens when you add a lot of capacitance to a coil. And you guys down in the comments answer this for the people who do not know. What happens when you put a lot of self-capacitance in a coil? Okay? You tell me. I know from my experiments what happens. So think about this because this is very important to run a system on potential. Okay? On volts. This is very important. My personal opinion is this is the way a system is going to show you something magical. And if you know what's happening, it's not magical, it's not mystified, you, you know what happens. But you got to think about it, okay? Okay, so I'm going to mark this out. All right. I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to talk about this first. I'm going to go back and, and, and talk about that. So, so the question becomes, instead of 100 pounds, we use 1,000. 1,000 pounds. The more copper atoms that you can align, the bigger the magnetic field. If you have maximum current in a wire, and all of the atoms are aligned, creating your magnetic field, right? The spins all aligning, however you want to view that happening, 
right? But if you do it with current, you generate heat, right? And once you get all the atoms aligned, this wire will allow for extra current to go through it. More than what the wire can handle, and it gets hot, and that's waste heat. Where if you use potential, even though it's still 10 watts, it will not dissipate the heat the same because it is restricted. But it has the same problem. You can't push more than what it allows through it. Okay? But this one generates heat, this one does not. Now what happens if you use a thousand pounds? What happens to this? And what happens to this? If I use the same 10 watts, right, then it's actually going to be difficult to get, right, and this, this would be the 48WG, right? It would be difficult to get more volts and currents through even, an, even a higher resistance to this. This is astronomical, by the way. But it's the same magnetic field. So what I'm trying to tell you is mass is important. Okay? The more mass, the bigger the field. The bigger the field, the longer you can hold the field in the coil. And you don't kill your dipole. Now I'm going to go back and talk about a few other things. Okay, there's a guy on the internet doing some cool stuff. I'm not going to say his name because I want you to figure it out. And those of you who know, don't say it. I mean, those of you who are following me closely that already know what I'm doing, where I'm going, where I'm headed. So let me ask you a very interesting question. This is actually something that most people never look at, and I have to thank one of my friends for pointing it out, because I didn't even think about it. didn't realize what I was... I don't know, I just didn't think about it. So thank you for that. You know who you are. If I have a coil... Okay, I have a coil, and I have it across the battery that it generates, right, in this case, magnetic flux, right? So, you disconnect it, whoop, and the magnetic flux goes away very rapidly. In the process, you get a back EMF. You also get current, also. You get a voltage spike, and you get current. Watts in equals watts out if the load doesn't consume the energy. Now, here's something that most people don't ever think about. What happens if I have a switch like this? Okay? So, the uh, switch has to be this way. All right, so the first thing that happens is you energize the coil. And by the way, when you open up this, like that, right, if you were talking about the magnetic field, it tries to go as fast as it possibly can. It tries. Okay, so this is a time frame. So, if you connect it, 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 it goes pretty instantly, and then it hangs, and it goes back down pretty instantly when you open. Well, what if, right here, you shorted the coil? What happens? Well, if the inductance is big enough and the field is big enough, you will notice that this decays. Mm -hmm. Time. You will notice that when you open it dramatically, it rapidly changes, and when you short it out, it slows down. Now, if you've ever put a diode across a coil, right? That's called a flyback diode. It's a wheel, freewheeling diode. Because what happens to the current is the current just stays in here and it dies through resistance. If this coil was a superconductor, it would not die. It would actually continue forever until the, heat, until the coil heated up and dissipated that flow of current inside there. Well, this is a very important concept. And why is it so important, Russ? It means that you can energize a coil really, really, really fast. 
But if you'd like to delay, right, if you'd like to delay this collapsing magnetic field, guess what? You can do that by shorting the coil. What does that mean? That means if you had a spitting, a spitting, a spinning, right, rotor, that means you could pulse it instantaneously, but you could hold the magnetic field so it had a longer push. See? With a shorted coil, you get this, right? But with a non-shorted coil, you get this. All right, so this is a very important concept because if you're going to apply this to only using voltage, it means you can turn voltage into a sustained magnetic field for a longer duration and do more work with the potential because current is circulating in here for much longer right, than what you put into it. It's instant, or close to it. Not quite, but... But anyway, this is a very important thing for you to think about. Now, instead of the short, right, instead of the short... Oh, come on, Russ. Can't roll. Okay. Instead of the short, what if I added a capacitor? Because now, the back EMF spike is going to try to charge this cap, but it's also going to try to slow the magnetic field down at the same time. It's like a two for one. I've done some bench, bench, bleh, I've done some bench testing with this idea, and I have not come to a full conclusion on my test results, and so I will not be including them in this discussion because I need a bigger coil. I've taken some pretty big coils and I've done this. And I need a bigger coil. You need the mass. I want to write that on the top. That is very important. I see I already used green for something fancy. Mass is good. Mass is very helpful. It's helpful. Oh man, okay. We're getting actually pretty close. Um, so I wanted to talk about something I discovered. Um, I took a reed switch and I took a nine volt battery and I took a um, Christmas light, a filament Christmas light. And I put it, I put the reed switch across the spinning magnetic wheel like I had drawn here and I was triggering it ultra fast. And I was triggering it so fast the light didn't have time to light up. So there was like an inrush current, but that's it. Not enough to light the filament. And what I noticed is it turned into a megahertz transmitter. 220 megahertz. Above 200 megahertz. When I say transmitter, I mean my oscilloscope has completely isolated grounds, completely isolated everything, shielded cables, and every single one of my probes was picking up this from many feet away. Now, what do we know about RF? It's ultra high frequency and ultra high frequency you start having the skin effect. So if I'm generating two, over 200 megahertz frequency, I'm generating a skin effect with nothing more than a reed switch, a light bulb, and a nine volt battery. And there's something interesting about that because if you're creating radio frequencies and you're creating high voltage radio frequencies, you're creating plasma which ends up being, if you actually generate plasma around the wire, you actually end up generating a resistance that's lower than the wire. And this is an interesting thing that I was playing with. Um, talked about the negative resistance already. Talked about the more mass. Hmm, copied that one twice. Um, the interesting thing is, is with the more copper you have and the finer the wire, you have to have higher voltage to get the same amount of magnetic field, the same amount of 10 watts through that guy. But you also have more capacitance in the coil, and you also get, I'm not going to tell you in this video, what else do you get? You get some benefit out of that, in my opinion. Still working out the math. But when you hit a certain point with a certain amount of mass, with a certain amount of copper, with a certain amount of wire, 
you had a certain amount of capacitance at a certain frequency and you end up with something very interesting. And I have not proven this to myself yet, and this is why I'm kind of conservative on this answer. But I believe in my head I know exactly what I'm looking at. And I think, I think this works. That's all I can really say. I, I, I don't know. Anyway, we'll get to that another day. I just want to bring up the points I brought up because it's very important. So now, here is the one thing that really screws you up. I'm almost done. And then I'm going to ask one more question that you're going to have to answer. Um, so, there was a quote that I read, and I'm sorry, I don't know who it's from. Somebody can put it down in the comments. But it says, You cannot learn what you think you already know. You cannot learn what you think you already know. That's a pretty interesting comment. You cannot learn what you think you already know. So if you walk around and you're like, I know, I already know all. Do you really, have you really played with just a coil and, a, and, a, and an inductor? I mean, and, you know, and, uh, have you really just played with a, 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 an inductor, a capacitor, and a uh, make and break switch? Have you, have you just played with that? Or do you say, oh, I know the math, so I know what happens? Well, the math only holds up so far. You have to remember that. It's math. It's true to its nature. But if the math isn't accurate to real world scenario, then the math doesn't work in the real world. Okay, and the reason I said you cannot learn what you think you already know is because of this reason. You need to have no biased opinion when you go into something. You need to have a very open mind, right? And you need to say, hey, I got an open mind about this. Whether I'm right or I'm wrong, I will accept my answer and I will have no bias opinion. And I may have talked about this already, but I'm bringing it up again because it is very important. If you think you already know it, then you won't learn <laughs> what you think you already know. And you need to go into that decision, into that thinking, with no biased view. Um, last question. This is what I'd like for you guys to answer. Because no one can answer it except for one person that I know of. This cannot spell. Spelling. I really don't like spelling. Uh, I don't really like math, to be honest with you, but I like vortex math. Pretty easy. Anyway, what is a field? I want you to describe what a field is. What is a dielectric field? What is a magnetic field? Don't tell me what EM is. Electromagnetic field. Don't, don't tell me what that is. I want to know what a magnetic field is. And I want to know what an electric field is. I don't want to know what both of them are. I don't care about electromagnetics right now. I care about magnetic or dielectric. What is actually happening in the field? How would you describe it? How does the field interact with a copper wire? How does the field interact with what's around it? What is the field? And this is some clues to help you where I'm headed. But I'm not going to tell you right now because... I'd like you to answer this question, because there's only one man I've ever met who's documented what a field is. What's happening in a field? What is really going on? What is the action and reaction? What is a field? Okay? And the last thing I've got to say is read your Bible more. A while back I made a decision, and that decision was to pursue this at 110% and not stop. And I must say that by going through the book, the Bible, reading certain things here and there has really, really helped me excel in my understanding, in, my, the, ability, in the ability to, to treat people and deal with situations and make big choices. Um, and I just want to throw that out there that, you know, not just technology, not just spiritual, not just faith, not just believing but all of it it's been helpful very helpful and if you're in a time of need or un unknowing or whatever just grab that thing and read a few places and man it's just like it's such great insight so with that i'll let you go by the way it's 9:33 in the p.m and i have to go 
get this video ready for tomorrow. God bless you guys. Have a good day. Please think about what I've said in this video because it's extremely important, in my opinion. Okay, bye-bye. Thanks for hanging out. What does it feel? All right. Thanks for watching. See you guys later.